Now, I'm a businessman, you see, and, and I believe that we're to live our best life now. Yeah. God put us on this planet to, to, be, to enjoy his blessing and his favor, to be healthy and wealthy. And I'm not the only one that thinks like this. There's a famous rabbi where I live that said this just the other day. God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money to fulfill the destiny he has laid out for us. Rabbi Joe Elostein. <laughs> Maybe you guys know of him. You see, that's the primary thought here in Israel. You see, if, if you're right with God, you have God's favor. So you'll be healthy, you'll be wealthy. You see, people who are sinners are the poor, the beggars, the lame, the blind. Either their sin or their parents' sin, but they're sinners, and so that's why they're in the condition they're in. Now, I know this to be true, what Rabbi Joe Elstein preaches, because it sounds good to me. It's what I want to hear. It's like when I, when I listen to him, it's like if I have an itchy ear, he tickles it for me. Yeah, I like his teachings, and, and, and this is the way I've based my life. Now, my story does begin in Bethlehem. I owned a little inn there, and it wasn't nothing much, but it was a start in business. And so my idea was to build this little inn up, and that when I make enough of a profit, I could flip it, I could sell it, and then I could take the profit, and I could move to Jerusalem, because that's where the big money is. So that's what I set out to do, trying to run this in and trying to make every, every penny count. But then one day my big break came. Caesar Augustus declared that a decree went out and, and that a census was going to be taken in all the land and that everyone had to travel back to their ancestral home, the town that their family came from to be registered. And, and Bethlehem is the house of David. So I knew a lot of people would be coming back to Bethlehem. It'd be a burden on most, and they would definitely need a place to stay. So, like any good businessman, I tripled my rates, just like that. I'm going to make some money off this census, yeah. Tripled my, what? <laughs> Thought you guys were capitalists here. Well, during the census, I filled up every room. Second or third night, this knock at my door. I went to the door, and there was this young man there, and he had his, his young wife, and she was pregnant. And he said, she's about to give birth. And I wish I had an extra room, because I could have charged them even more, but I was all filled up. But he was desperate. And then it came to me. I, I, I got a stables out back. I mean, it's full of animals, it's dirty, it's, but hey, I, I couldn't charge them full price, but maybe half price. And that's when my wife poked me in the back and said, you can't do that. So I said, fine, and let her, let them go back there for free. Boy, that was a mistake. I couldn't get to sleep for hours. Why do women have to make such, such loud noises during birth? Ladies, it hurts. Come on. If man gave babies, it'd be like that. Right? I've never understood ladies always use that pregnant card, but I don't know. But somewhere in the night, things quieted down. So I figured that she gave birth and I could finally go to sleep. So I drifted off to sleep thinking about all that money I'd been making. It was a good night. But then I woke up the next morning, and the whole town was a buzz, and, and it, was, it was crazy, and, and there was these shepherds, and they were going around telling everybody about angels that had appeared in the night, and that the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. The kid in my, in my stables was the Messiah, and everyone was going about all crazy like, and I'm like, what's going on here? And then my wife was like, oh, you didn't have room for the Messiah. It's like, no way. The Messiah is going to be like, 
royalty, man. When he comes, he's not going to be born in some dirty stable. He'll be born in a palace somewhere. That little baby, that, that baby they called Jesus, he wasn't the Messiah. Messiah wouldn't be born in a place like that. Oh, so after a couple days, things calmed down, went back to normal. And I added up all the money I had made during the census. And then I had a buyer for my inn, and I made even more money. And I had enough to relocate to Jerusalem. Yeah, because, you know, Jerusalem is where the temple is. And the priests run a perfect racket there. You see, sinners have to come to the temple and purchase a sacrificial animal. And the priests run the markets and control the flow of the animals and the price and the money changing back and forth. And, and then you can kind of put any price you want because without this little sacrificial animal with the blood, the sins can't be forgiven, right? So people have to come and purchase a sacrificial animal. And guess what's so good about this? What's so amazing? Everybody's a sinner. Isn't that great? I mean, it's like an unending business profit potential. So everybody's a sinner, so everybody needs those little animals. And so I moved in to that market, and I became a money changer in the temple. Just loving that everybody is a sinner. Now, for the next 30 years, I have done, I did really well, done very well. I have gained so much, so much wealth. I even purchased properties throughout Jerusalem. Last season, I purchased a farm. And my harvest was so bountiful that I didn't even have enough room in my barns to fit it all. So I had all this excess. And then my wife was like, well, why, why don't you give the excess to the poor? <laughs> what kind of profit can you make in that? I'm a businessman. So I had a better idea. I tore down my old barns and I did what? Build new ones. You guys think like me. Built bigger barns so I could fit it all in there. And I'm looking at everything I have and I'm like, wow, I am so blessed by God. All my success. <sighs> But you know, to be honest with you, and I'm not usually honest with people, I thought at this stage I'd be happier. I mean, I have everything I want, everything I need, but I, I don't feel fulfilled inside. I don't know. It kind of wears at me trying to figure out what I've missed. So I figured maybe, maybe I just need more. Maybe I need a bigger house, more money. Maybe that's what I need to do. Then I'll have a fulfilled life. So I decided I'm going to work extra hard. And the day I decided to, to work extra hard is, is the day my life actually started to turn upside down. Yeah. I was in the temple at my table and all of a sudden off in the distance I hear this ruckus, people screaming. I heard a whip snapping in the air and I'm like, what is going on? And I looked over and here comes this, this rabbi and he's, he's angry. He's whipping people. People are trying to get away from him. He's, he's coming over and he's turning over tables of the other money changers. And he's going to the pens and he's letting the animals out and it's chaos. And at, at first I thought it was kind of funny until he looked over at me. And he was angry. And he comes over and he flips my table. My coins are scattered everywhere. And I'm like, who do you think you are? And he got right in my face. And he said, 
No. No. And he said, your heart is like your old inn. There's no room for the things of God. There's no room for me. I was offended. Who is this guy to judge my heart? Who is he? Shortly after that, he left. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't care for what he had told me. I didn't understand it, but I didn't care for it either. People said that this rabbi, his name was Jesus. And I was like, Jesus? And there was something familiar about that name, but I, I just couldn't place it. All I knew is I didn't want to see that Jesus anymore. He needs to stay away from me and my table. Well, a few days later, this Jesus enters the temple again. I could hear him from my table. He wasn't turning anything over this time. He was teaching. But I could hear him from my table, and this is what he was teaching. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Yeah. Yes. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rise from the dead. <sighs> what? Boy, someone needs to teach that rabbi the truth here. That's completely backwards. The beggar goes to be with Abraham and the rich man goes to Hades? Oh, my word, that's completely backward. The wealthy are wealthy because they're righteous. The beggars are sinners. <sighs> I, I, I couldn't believe he was teaching that. So I got up, and I walked over, and there were some Pharisee friends of mine. And the Pharisees are good guys, right? And I asked them, I said, what, do you, what, do you, what is this about this Jesus? Why, why is he teaching things like this? And they, they told me, don't worry about him. He's nothing. They even told me this, that his mother is a woman of low reputation, if you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? She doesn't even know who the father is of Jesus. I knew it. Who could, somebody like that has to be completely wrong in what they're saying. The Pharisees, I trusted the Pharisees. Who was more righteous than the Pharisees? Anybody? No. Who said that? Pharisees. But about that time, as I'm standing there with my Pharisee friends, and we were basically bashing Jesus, Jesus looked over at us, and he started a new story. Two men went up to the temple to pray, 
one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now that's a good man, Jesus. Now you're getting the story correct. I mean, I, that's like me. I mean, I don't pray. And I don't fast. But hey, just the other day, Jesus, I was standing in line at the treasury. And there was this little old lady in front of me. And she had two mites, two pennies. And I had my, my excess money that I had made profit gold coins and she had two pennies and she put the pennies in and I put this in now who do you think is more righteous oh I stumped you huh Jesus no Duval, you're not listening to what I'm sharing with you open your ears that you might hear this yeah whatever go ahead and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's right. Tax collectors are the worst. I don't care how long they beat their breasts and beg. They cannot be forgiven by God. Go ahead. You already said it, though, that all were sinners. So that means even you. Hey, don't use my own words against me. I can. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. <gasps> For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You're killing me, Jesus. You're going against everything I've ever believed. Who are you to be teaching such things? This is just not right. I wasn't going to listen to any more of this. So I packed up my table and I went home for the day. But I got to tell you that night, everything that he had said just kept rolling around in my mind. I struggled with it all night. Could, could this Jesus be right? Could he? That actually didn't happen, but hey. It was a long night. The next day I returned to the temple, hoping that I would not see that Jesus again. But there he was, teaching. And at that moment, as I was trying to sneak by so he couldn't see me, he saw me. And he looked right at me. And he said this to the crowd. The ground of a certain rich man yield plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will store all my crops and my goods. And it will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. How does he know that? Oh, wait a minute. You can see through this thing. <laughs> How did he know? Is he really he? Is Jesus the Messiah? How did he know I did that? I didn't tell anybody. Who is this guy? Oh, I wish I had never heard the name of Jesus. Jesus, what, what is it with that name? What is it so familiar to me? Wait a minute. Jesus was the name of that baby born in... The stables of my old inn. The one the shepherd said the angels declared. That was his name. That was like 30 years ago. And... Wow. Oh, wait a minute. What, what did Jesus say to me when he turned over my uh, table? He said, your heart is like your old inn. No room for the things of God. No room for me. What am I going to do? It sounds like he knows my very heart. 
He knows things that no one could know. Is he going to take his revenge on me because I, I didn't give his mom a room? He said in his story that my soul was going to be required of me of this night. Am I about to die? Is my time up? I'd gladly give all the money I have to save my soul. What am I going to do? There's no way Jesus will forgive me for what I've done. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. My burden of sin is so heavy. I try to ignore it, but I can feel it. It weighs on my heart. My soul is tormented in the deep, dark hours of the night. I know, I know who I really am. Just then, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is he offering to forgive me? Is, is forgiveness possible for a person like me? What? You guys didn't sound so sure. Should I turn from my evil ways? Go to him? I mean, I want to be right before God, but to be honest, I don't know if I can do it. You see, this has been my whole life. How about this? Since I'm a businessman, Jesus, let's, let's talk here. Let's, let's make a deal. How about this? I'll believe in you. I'll even confess you to others. I'll try to follow all your teachings, but there's a lot. You know what I'm talking about? I'll try to keep the commandments. I'll keep them. I know a rich young ruler says he keeps them all. If he keeps them, I know I can keep them. I know that guy. I'll try to treat others with love and respect. I'll do good here and there. I'll give a little more to the treasury. And, you know, I'll try to go into those boring services at the synagogue. You know, unless I got something better to do. But, um, hey, does, does that sound like a good deal, Jesus? You're missing the point. One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the oh, poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Have you not read the art of the deal? Compromise, give and take here. You know, come on, meet me halfway, Jesus, because, you know, I, I know I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I guess you see it all, don't you, Jesus? Yes. <sighs> okay. You know what kind of man I am. You don't want to make a deal. I can't seem to meet you halfway. It's either your way or the highway, I see. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> but I know something. God is love. Another rabbi wrote, love wins in the end. Meaning, God is love. He won't judge people and put them in hell. 
So, Jesus, if you love me, you cannot judge me. Listen to this. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Oh, man. You just got an answer for everything, don't you, Jesus? Yes. Do you know anything else but yes? You know, I had a lot of great notes here about me, and you've kind of taken them all away. Left me in front of these people, literally wretched, blind, and naked. And I understand because I, I know I'm a wretch. But I've been a wretch for so long, I don't know if I could turn from it. What should I do, folks? How many of you were wretches before you came to Christ? I didn't see every hand come up. Well, I need to think about this. Because I heard Jesus teach one time, and he said, count the cost. You know, coming to Jesus is a life-changing situation. It's a moment that your life is never the same again. Everything you were doing before, maybe the life you were living is going to have to come to an end and you're going to have a new path. That's not a decision to make lightly coming to Christ. So maybe if you guys could sing a song or, or something to help me figure out, give me time to figure out what I'm supposed to do here. Make it a nice happy song. Good. Lift my spirits up because Jesus has just basically squashed me. Let me think about this. Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill. Oh
feel lighter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I guess I'm related to y'all now, huh? Yep. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you say. I've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, the filth, the wretchedness, the self-centeredness. Glory to God, we're clean. Born again, as Jesus taught. And all can do it. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from, what you've done. The truth is, each one of us needs to understand who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, and you can reject it, you can ignore it, like I did so many years, but sooner or later, you've got to come and make a decision based on who He is and what He teaches. And what He teaches is the truth, and you can't get away from it. The truth of God pierces into the very heart and soul of a person. And if you listen to his words, you can't escape them. And we have to understand we're separated from, from Christ. We're separated from God by our sins. Sins that we've all chosen to do. Breaking the laws of God. And that's why he came to bring us back. To be the mediator. To pay for our sins as the perfect Lamb of God. But when we come to Him, we can't come to Him on our own terms. You can't make a deal with God like I tried. And I've heard many people over the years say, I have a, we have an understanding with God. No, there's His way. And that's it. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. And He said, we must repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. We can't come to him on our own terms. We can't come to him holding on to our sin. We have to be willing to lay it at his feet and turn from it. Pick up our cross and follow him. It's a life-changing moment. It's what we call being born again. Spiritually, not physically, but spiritually. It's a new start for us. And Jesus said, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. He even told that to a Pharisee called Nicodemus. And if the Pharisees, who were the most quote-unquote righteous in our culture, who knew more of the word of God than anybody else, if they needed to repent, and Nicodemus was one of the good ones, then all of us need to repent. That's what was, Bethlehem was all about. I missed it. Most of Bethlehem missed it that night that the Messiah was born. And what's so sad is Israel missed it as a whole and continued to miss it 30 years later when the Messiah fulfilled Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of Israel, and he died on the cross. Today, people are still missing it. They're not understanding the significance of the baby born in Bethlehem. They're not understanding the significance of Jesus dying on the cross. 
They have a belief, but not an understanding. And true saving belief causes faith. Faith is action. It's acting upon what Jesus said. Turn from your sins, put your faith in me, and come follow me. Be obedient to him as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone in here understands that. If you don't, please, I'll be glad to talk to you, answer any questions you have. But this is also something we must share with people. Everyone needs to know this. And if he can forgive a person like myself, a person like the Apostle Paul, he can forgive anybody. Nobody's beyond God's grace. And that is the message that we must share this Christmas season. The baby was given to us so that we could taste of the grace of God. And where sin abounds, grace abounds more. So if you've never put your faith in Christ, you need to have that moment. You need to turn from your sins and put your faith in the Son of God. And if you have, it's time to tell somebody else. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful words and the stories we have in your word of ordinary people just like us going through life dealing with so many issues and you're working in their lives and finding them like the woman at the well like the adulterous woman brought before you Nicodemus Tom Thomas when he was in his doubt Lord you worked in so many lives and you continue to do so because you were alive and sitting on the throne at this very moment. And you're still, your spirit is still in the world calling people to you. And we are to be the tools, we're to be the vessels in your hands to help people come to you. You can use us, Lord, to speak to people, to draw them to the truth, to share with them. I ask you to help us to be those good vessels you can use. And Lord, if there's someone that's in here who doesn't know if they're a believer or not, please put it on their heart to know for them to put their faith in you. We thank you for the grace and the mercy. And we thank you for the little baby in Bethlehem. And all God's people said, amen. amen. <coughs> I was trying to hold that off through the prayer. Sorry, excuse me. Well, listen, may I should do characters more often. I'm getting done before time. That went a little quicker than I thought, but that's okay. I'm glad everybody came out today. I know it's been a holiday weekend. I know there's a lot of people that are sick this last week. Something went through a lot of people this last week, but I'm glad to see you here this morning, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week as we start December this week. So just a countdown to Christmas. And uh, every day is an opportunity for us to go out there to be salt and light, possibly to witness to somebody, to share the gospel. But again, we want to take people directly to Jesus. So if you have that opportunity, it's not about they have to believe in God or they need to get right with God. Let's take them to Jesus Christ because you can't go to God without Jesus. Let's not bypass Jesus. Let's tell them the reason for the season. All right, Team Jesus, let's go out and break onto the playing field of the world. On the count of three, we break out of here. One, two, three, break. Let's go. <laughs>